Did you see that rainbow when we came in? Anybody see that? Wasn't that fantastic? Wasn't that lovely, eh? What a treat. I want to... Um, I, think that's, I think the story that you've just heard from Peter is the most important story in the world. But I want to reframe that with a little help from some pictures, because I think it's pictures that help stories come alive. Here's the deal. We're changing the atmosphere of the planet. The bit we're changing is the bit that controls the temperature. And the speed at which we're changing it is completely unprecedented. And the problem, I think, is that the gases in the atmosphere, we can't see them, they're invisible. And that makes it very difficult for us to properly engage with this giant challenge that we call climate change. I love this quote from probably the world's first scientist, the idea that we live at the bottom of an ocean of air. Isn't that fantastic? So just, can you do something? You just wet your fingers like that, okay, and just go like that. You can feel that ocean, can't you? Isn't that great? And what's wonderful is that you can do that anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another picture of that ocean of air. If we roll the atmosphere into a ball at sea level pressure and 15 degrees centigrade, it would look like that. I first came across this image um, five years ago and used it on the cover of a report that we did about carbon neutrality. And I then got in touch with the guy who did it called Adam Neiman, who's a fantastic scientist and artist. And to cut a very long story short, we decided to set up a business with him to help turn um, to, to help create um, um, pictures of any carbon footprint or carbon data. And the basic deal is we take uh, mass, which is kilos and tons and gigatons, and we turn it into a volume in a landscape that the audience is familiar with. So that's a picture of all the natural carbon dioxide in the world. Um, uh, that's, that's been there um, and what, what is, what's amazing about, about, about that is, is that if it wasn't there, we would have no plants. And we would also uh, have a temperature that was considerably lower than it is today. And then we can say, well, that's the bit that we've put in since the Industrial Revolution. And we keep on doing it. We keep on adding more to the atmosphere. 80 million tons a day, that's the number. But how do you make sense of 80 million tons? Well, if we were to pump that 80 million tons through the UN building in New York, it would look like this. Is it going to start? There we are. Seven times every four seconds. That's the speed at which we're putting CO2 into the atmosphere as a species. I'm not, by the way, suggesting that we do that. Um, but another way of looking at the 80 million tons a day is to imagine it as a single layer over our heads around the whole planet and if we did that it would be 80 microns thick that's the thickness of a piece of paper so here's the deal every day we wrap the planet in another paper thick layer of co2 and we keep on doing it 30 millimeters a year a little over an inch and a quarter of that, of course, is absorbed in, in soils and forests, another quarter in the oceans, which is acidifying, and the rest adds to the layer up there, which is reflecting more heat back to the planet. We call this way of looking at the, uh, at the emissions um, the carbon quilt, because a quilt is made up of patches, and you can allocate any patch to any human activity. So here's a patch. This is uh, the US carbon footprint, a big one, another one, the UK's carbon footprint. But with this method, we can also take it down to scale, something smaller like, say, the, a car journey. So that's one way of looking at the carbon emissions. Um, another way is to turn um, volumes into spheres and cubes. So this is London's daily CO2 emissions, 135,000 tonnes. We're familiar with these buildings. Um, but I think seeing that uh, in that landscape gives us a better sense of um, what is otherwise uh, uh, just a number. Um, we can use photographs. So that's the um, annual carbon footprint of a radio program, one BBC One Planet. Um, and that's what a tonne of CO2 looks like. So these are all ways of showing a single carbon footprint. Here we're using a model of that ship which puts 16 tonnes of CO2 a day into the atmosphere. We're using the model actually to show the scale. 
So these are, these are single images which I think help people become aware and go, oh yeah, that's real. But that's not enough. We need to actually be able to show more complex stories and I think multiple data sets. So for instance, here, um, seeing the volume of CO2 associated with a kilometer of travel might help us make the, a choice when we're deciding to take the car or the tube or the bus or whatever. And another example, on the right we have an old-fashioned 60 watt light bulb, on the left we have um, a, an energy saving light bulb. That's the amount of CO2 that goes into the atmosphere over 24 hours. <coughs> This is an extract from a film that we did showing the breakdown of greenhouse gas emissions in a kilo of potatoes grown in the UK. And there we are. And um, that's the amount, 180 grams of CO2 on average for that kilo of potatoes. The nice thing about using this kind of technique with film is that we can then switch the scale. And uh, we can go to a typical potato farm, 200 hectares in this case, look at the carbon footprint associated with the growing and the storing and the transport of potatoes from that farm. And the film then goes on to show how that, those emissions can be reduced uh, uh, and helps the farmer see that and, and so on. Um, the BBC wanted to show what the footprint was of an hour's worth of TV programme and so they got a lot of data together and we turned that into this uh, set of images which basically show an hour's worth of TV production and by putting it outside the White City TV centre you get a sense of the scale and it was first shown in that building. Here's another way of looking at that eight tonnes Per, per hour, which is the emissions from a an, uh, TV programming. That's what it looks like in real time. Imagine being able to fly over a city landscape and actually see the carbon footprint of all the buildings below you. Well, our team managed to do just that with Google Earth. This is, these are the public buildings in Exeter. Those are the annual carbon footprints, the actual volumes of the gas emitted by public buildings. They're color coded according to the um, energy certificates that they have to supply, uh, uh, display. And um, the, the, on, the, on the floor area uh, viewing so that the higher ones are less efficient, okay? And um, yeah, we get to here. Here we are, 180 tons a year. The building behind it is um, a little higher and I wonder why, why that is. And the one behind that is actually half the floor area, the Henry Welcome building, but it's twice the CO2 emissions per square meter. Um, is there an energy manager in the house? Can we find out? <laughs> so I just want to finish with this picture that I took uh, six years ago of my granddaughter. It shows a kilo of CO2. We breathe out one of those every day as a creature, but we've put another 14 of those directly into the atmosphere from our own activities in the UK. Um, and we all know the mantra, think global, act local, but that's easier said than done because we experience the world in two distinct ways. We experience it directly as embodied beings and indirectly and statistically. And up to now, we've only been able to understand the causes of climate change through numbers. And the numbers are important, but we also need to incorporate more direct and sensory ways of experiencing the global as well as the local. I think the solutions to change are out there, but in order to get change to happen, we need to be able to see the cause of the problem in the landscapes of our lives. Thank you. <coughs>